so we are live on. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of the Berlin Science Week. My name is uh, Martin Rame. I'm uh, the coordinator of Green Chem, uh, as well as the director of the Chemical Invention Factory. And what that exactly is, you will hopefully know exactly by the end of my talk. Um, but before going into detail, uh, maybe a little personal introduction about my <laughs> myself, that you get to know me a little bit better. Um, in my private life, I'm very engaged for environmental protection. I'm uh, the first pre or the president of an NGO that is uh, qualified by the Umweltbundesamt, so the uh, Federal Agency for Environmental Protection, and we do renaturation work here in Brandenburg. So, characterized my personality is more or less: I love what I do, and I do what I love, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm really engaged for environmental protection, not only in my private life, but also in my professional life, and that is what I will talk about today. I will talk about two main topics, about chemistry, as the title says, and about innovation, and a special type of innovation, a disruption. Um, for the next one hour and 50 minutes, approximately, uh, we will have like three parts of this session. First of all, I will give you uh, like a 20-minute talk about those two topics, my viewpoint on it, where do we stand in terms of innovation? What is a disruptive innovation? Where do we stand uh, in chemistry? What is green chemistry, basically? Why do we need it? What role do startups play? Um, yeah, and, and what Berlin has to offer here in this, in, in, this, uh, in this circumstance, so to speak. Then afterwards, we will I will welcome one of our startups in our ecosystem, uh, Wild. Uh, Stephanie is also here. She will give a like what is called the pitch, a very short pre uh, presentation of her startup, uh, and then we will have a Q and A because what I will talk about, I think it's much more profound if we discuss if that's really not only my perception but also viewed by the startups I'm I'm helping to become successful. Okay, uh, throughout the session, uh, we have planned to be very interactive. Uh, th this is in. in basically three ways. First of all, we use Slido. So every one of you, I suppose, has a mobile phone, has a smartphone. There will be some QR codes. I, you will see that clearly. And I want to go into interaction using that tool. Second of all, if you have any question, if something is not understandable, um, yeah, please raise your hand. Or we have some microphones here. Um, um, and then, yeah, I will try to, or we will try to answer your questions. This is also live streamed. So please use the microphones. Um, and last but not least, at the end, we would love to hear about your opinion, about your perception of today's talk and, and the session here. What do you like? Where do you see improvements? That's the, that's the three parts of interaction. OK, so far to the setting. Um, let's get into the topic a little in terms of chemistry. Who of you guys? Ha is a chemist or is working in a chemistry related field? First question, please, hand sign. Okay, that's uh, I see like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ish, ten ish. That's uh, approximately, I'd say, like 30 people. That's one third. It's quite a lot, actually, <laughs> if you compare the average uh, 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 in our uh, country. Um, second of all, okay, that's good. Um, I will not talk very much in detail about chemistry. I basically only have one molecule. Um, I forgot something. <laughs> I only got one molecule uh, in my slide. That's uh, for the next slide. But um <coughs> so we are here in the birds room, right? And my first hypothesis is chemistry is everywhere. And we sat together in the team and thought about, OK, where do we correlate? Where do can we bond with birds, right? And as and we had we came up in a short brainstorm session uh, and we saw many things. First of all, um, like color, color or the coloration of those beautiful birds. This is basically chemistry and physics, but lots and lots of chemistry. But I thought, it, well, this is too complicated. Then second of all, those are exhibits, right? It's unfortunately, dead animals, so we have to preserve them in order not to kill every year an animal in order to exhibit it here. So we thought about the preservation methods of chemistry. Actually, talking about dead birds is not that, you know, as, a, as an environmentalist, I thought it's maybe not that positive. So I thought about the third uh, thing about birds. Uh, and this is very personal, I think, because I love to watch birds. Um, and these days, 
like the 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 the, the, the tip of the of the spear is the um, are the um, birds of prey, right? Like the the hunters, the raptors. And these days, today in Germany, like the biggest raptor is basically our um, heraldic animal, right? The the the, the, the eagle. These days, we have roughly 650 breeding pairs in Germany. So even in Berlin, the capital of, of, of Germany, you can see um, eagles. When I was a kid, or uh, approximately almost 50 years ago, there were, it was almost extinct. There were no eagles in Germany. And there were obviously, th this is a positive development over the last 50 years, and there are many, many different reasons for it, but one of them has to do with chemistry and was a major one, and this was this one. This molecule is an insecticide, it's called DDT. And um, it was banned in 1993 because scientists discovered that the DDT that kills insects, this, those insects, are eaten by bigger animals, those bigger animals are then e eaten at some point at the tip of, of the food chain, chain by the raptors, by eagles. And what happens then is, when they lay their eggs, the shell of the eggs becomes thinner and thinner and thinner, ma making the breeding success of the birds ba basically not a success anymore. So the, the number were declining. So in 1992, based on those scientific findings, it was banned in, in Germany, and in 2004 it was banned worldwide. And since then we see a dramatic increase in birds, especially in seagulls. So my hypothesis is not only that chemistry is everywhere, but chemistry is very important if we want to protect our planet. Uh, so. Giving you that little bonding to where we are, birds, in chemistry today, I want to interact the first time with you guys. Um, I want to ask you one question, and I want you now to pull out your smartphone and answer the following question. What are your feelings towards chemistry? What are your feelings towards chem? What do you feel about when you hear the word chemistry, when you think about it, what do you feel? So please scan it with your QR scanner. You will then see like a text box and then write down your feelings. Give it like one and a half, two minutes. And then once those one and a half, two minutes are gone, we will, ha we will have a joint look towards the results, but not yet. First of all, scan it. And then think about your feelings. Very uncommon to talk about feelings. Okay, here comes the first results. Nine people are typing in, 13 people, that's good. Anyone, d does anyone need the QR code? No, okay, so anyone's typing. Oof. Yep, okay. Nine people are still typing. You can, you can have various words. <laughs> oh, there's the QR code too, it's cool, that's nice. <laughs> okay, potential hope. Five per five people are typing. Toxic. Okay, yeah. Might come to my <laughs> because of my example, right? But that's fine. Yeah. Okay, three people. Okay, let's let's have a short summary. What do we do? What do we see here? Um, excitement, fascination. Okay, potential. So very positive. Um, hopeful, creative. But we also see lots of negative things, right? Toxic, afraid, scary, um, doubtful, um, dangerous, curiosity, okay, it's something of both, incredible. Yeah, so basically we, we have mixed feelings here, right? I see mixed feelings. And uh, I want to basically, we are here not a representative number of people from Germany, but I have a study that shows the results. And so I want you to switch back to the, to the presentation. Thank you. So I now want to show you, not the results, but I want to, if who is interested in, this is a study from the Rheingold Institute, um, published in 2001, who were investigating the question I was posing you a little bit more detailed, right? But we're basically discovering um, two things. Um, first of all, the feeling to, from chemistry after the Second World War changed from being that is, that is giving us growth 
innovation, prosperity, a positive feeling about innovation and growth, right? Towards nowadays, it is um, an uh, environmentally um, destroying discipline. So it's very negative, negatively perceived these days. And the trend is increasing. So people are, like the broader public is perceiving chemistry according to this study, a renowned study, uh, as being an environmental destroyer. And I'm not greenwashing here. Um, there are many, many examples, as DDT showed, right, um, that are harmful to us, that are toxic, that are bad. So totally agree, and whoever has seen this movie, you know I'm a, I love movies, uh, so whoever has seen this, this is a movie about a real thing that happened, about the Teflon scandal by uh, Dupont, chem one of the biggest uh, American chemical corporations. It's, it's, it's not old, right? It's in the 2000s, in the beginning of the 2000s. And me, myself, I, I was an entrepreneur uh, in, the in, in, in the chemical industry. What fascinated me, the feeling when watching that movie was very accurate. So being in, 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 being in chemical industry, it is very opaque, it is very not transparent, everyone smiles at you, but behind your back people are, you know, giving you the knife into your back. So, and I think this is what we have to change. It's not only a technology change, what, what I will talk about today, but it is also a cultural change. We need to be on eye level, we need to face the negative impacts, and this means for you, being two-thirds not being related to chemistry, please, never ever perceive something as only being bad, right? There's always another side of it. Only, you know, claiming that chemistry is bad will not do any good, yeah? will not do any good. We need, to, we need to better understand what do you think is bad. Okay, this is truly bad. What can we do in order to change it? And we need curiosity. We need people that go into and tap into the field of chemistry because nowadays what I perceive is they're either PhDs in chemistry, 80% who do a PhD, uh, who do the field of chemistry pers uh, pursue a PhD afterwards. So either you meet someone who's really deeply into it and having a PhD, or 98% of people I meet are saying, oh no, chemistry, that's the, that's the evil thing. I hate it in school and I really, I'm, I'm not into it at all. So this is no balance here. If we want to see innovations, we need all disciplines even from, from social science, even from, from other cultural, uh, or from other disciplines. We need people interested in chemistry, not being afraid of tapping into it, not being afraid of asking questions like, okay, this sounds fascinating, please explain more to me, right? So this is, this is my take on it um, when it comes to, to chemistry. So why is it important to talk about chemistry and go into this detail? Well, first of all, it's because of our planet, right? It, this is Mother Mother Earth. We have to protect it. It's such a beautiful, this is Earthrise uh, shot in 68 and it really made every one of us clear. It's such an endangered little planet and we are basically, you know, we are not, we are not really taking care of this planet, right? There are many, many examples. Uh, you, I'm sure you're aware of it. Um, but one number summarizes that for me because the picture would, must look like this. This is the so-called Earth Overshot Day, some of you might heard of, which says like we are consuming the resources of our planet as if we would have 1.7 planets. And this is the opposite of being sustainable, right? And if we only look at Germany and the Western countries, this number would go up to 3.5. So Germany alone consumes resources as if we would have 3.5 planets, if we take that average to all countries, all humans. So I'm not arguing chemistry can do that alone. N we need all efforts, right? We need also consumer behaviors, right? We talk about vegetarian, di uh, uh, um, uh, dietary and so on. So we need to change on our personal level, but also in all other different fields. And chemistry, and especially chemistry in Germany, in my opinion, has very high responsibility. Why? Well, first of all, we are number two, uh, we are really good in doing research. Number two in Nobel Prizes in chemistry. So we are really good in Germany with 80 million people only in discovering new discoveries, new scientific findings in chemistry. Yeah? 
Furthermore, we are a really huge industry, 220 billion industry, number three in the world, measured by sales, right, with 80 million people. So we know a lot, we make a lot of money, but more importantly, almost all touchable products have, as, have at least one chemical synthesis step. There's a study saying 97% of all tangible products of our daily life have at least one chemical reaction step, right? So if we want to change that picture to 1.0 planets, or I would argue 0.9 planets, because we have to give Mother Earth a little rest, yeah, to recover, to, re to heal, chemistry must play a role, right? But where do we stand? Well, in industry, 87% of all fossil of all resources used are fossil based. We living in a linear industry, disposing everything, not thinking about recycling it, and taking the resource base from fossils. So there's a long, long way ahead of us. The good thing is, yeah, the good thing is, um, we have the so-called 12 principles of green chemistry. We have some rules, some guidance, some examples, some yeah, principles um, that help chemists and chemical engineers to develop products that are sustainable, that are not toxic, uh, following the rules. Discovered by this very good friend, a mentor, also like the name giver of my house uh, from America, uh, Professor John Warner, who together with a colleague of his, uh, this wrote down 25 years ago those 12 principles of chemistry and he himself uh, discovered 30, uh, 350 patents, spin out over uh, uh, nine spin outs in order to make this findings and reachers count. But now, so I think everyone is aware of chemistry is everywhere, and we have a rule of changing that. But let me s tell you one thing: this so-called chemie vendor, the change of how we do chemistry, not fossil based, renewable. Uh, thinking in recycling loops, being non-toxic, being degradable. This is a dramatic change. This is nothing that is easily done, right? And this is what I call, or what science calls, a disruptive change. It is not an incremental innovation. It's not something minor we, bu uh, we build. It is something we have to change fundamentally. And what can we learn from it? Uh, well first of all, I want to make you a little bit more awareness of what is a disruption. And I want to use an analogy, an analogy to my second desire, which is sports. I love sports. Uh, and when I was a little boy, I was always watching with my parents sports. And one of the things we were watching, especially in winter time, was ski jumping. And, you know, looking back at those times when I was 10 years old, everyone was jumping like this. That's the so-called parallel style. Some of you might remember, the younger, uh, the younger of you might, uh, will both probably not. Then in 1986, uh, there comes a Swedish guy, and he was really bad at jumping. He was not even midfield. He was like always like in you know, lower rankings. And he came up with a, uh, with a style that is now called the V-style. And if you watch ski jumping nowadays, everyone jumps like this. But in ski jumping, it is... Um, when it's not on, uh, uh, the one who wins is not the one who jumps the furthest, but they were also graded. Yeah? You receive 20 points if it looks beautiful, if it lo doesn't look beautiful, how you land and how you fly and so on. You got degraded by like 18 things yeah? and so on and so on. Like zero points is the lowest. And when he introduced the V style in 86 the first time, he got degraded heavily. He received six points instead of 20, four points instead. Of, and he was never winning a tournament in the first year, even though he was jumping further than all his colleagues. So, and this I can really remember, there was a big debate going on and it took like two or three years until everyone understood, okay, there's a logic behind. He jumps like this, he has a higher surface, with a higher surface you can fly further. So other competitors adapted to it and you saw like the next year, three other people were jumping, the next year after, like 10 people were jumping like this. And so there was a real big debate going on. And this is what I call, and nowadays everyone is jumping like this. There's no uh, degradation of jumping like this. I would argue if someone would, would fly like this today, they would get degraded. Yeah? And this is what I call a disruptive innovation. It changes the rules of the game. Yeah? 
and whoever and uh, uh, whoever wants to understand and gets a feeling how hard it is to find or to to implement something that is truly better into a world that says well i don't like it please watch that movie the concussion protocol also true events shows you like um the fight of this doctor uh, medicine arts doctor a uh, doctor who um discovered uh, like in in the in the football that when people when, when the players hit their their heads like they they receive micro lesions and when they get older they get really bad diseases and discovering something discovering the truth truth as a scientist and fighting against the biggest sport organization a fight you didn't want you didn't pick yourself it was given to you by a scientific finding this was really a, a good example how hard it is to change something even if you believe it's true you know it's true but you have to convince all the others and and this gives you like a feeling about how hard it is to really accomplish disruptive change okay obviously there's also a science behind it right you can uh, th this is a sports analogy but you can take this towards business towards technology development and so on and what and this is what the theory tells us right you can over the time you can you can plot the technology performance like parallel jumping yeah they were like kind of at the end they couldn't jump further with the technique then Berkloff came and he was jumping with the v style and they could clearly jump further but very importantly is this intersection here at the beginning he was not jumping further the first two three hundred jumps were not further than the parallel style so it took some time in order to climb up you know this learning curve and overcome the old technology and this is one of the characteristics that the new technology is lower performing yet it has a higher potential uh, so this is the this is the the area where discontinuity begins where the fight of what is better what is worse really leads to arguments and leads to beliefs rather than proofs and this is one important characteristic of disruptive innovation you have to understand the second one i want to highlight with another example coming closer to business the ship industry back in the days people were sailing right and then an innovative guy came around the corner made an incremental innovation and say like why do we sail only with one mast let's make this let's say two and then another guy came well let's uh, let's do this right and then let's do this and then okay let's be really crazy let's do this yeah and what happens then is not a six mass then it comes then comes this disruption takes place and what is important here to understand is that the capabilities of putting masks on sailing boats and coordinating the people on a sailing boat is one thing and it's very complicated thing no doubt about it but those capabilities are not at all needed when using a steam vessel so disruption has one thing at the beginning the performance is inferior and at the same time the capabilities you need in order to execute the disruptive technology are others are different than the ones of the highly excelled technology currently being deployed and those are two characteristics of my main point when you look in industry and that is observed over many 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 industries by Clayton Christensen he discovered or he calls it disruptive innovation theory he discovered over many industries that the disruptive innovations have never been found by the dominant players but by new entrants the digital photography was not invented by Kodak and Agfa right Wikipedia was not discovered or not implemented by Brockhaus and so on and you can find many examples like Tesla was not invented by Volkswagen BMW or Mercedes right so this is very important when we are talking about disruptive innovation about the change in the game about doing things completely differently we need new entrants we need new players and this is my point first of all i think green chemistry is changing the game and second of all i think it is new players that will lead that change according to theory yeah? that is my hypothesis so and this is why 
and now I make make like the loop what my job is. I'm the coordinator of GreenCam. What is GreenCam? GreenCam is the innovation ecosystem for innovations in green chemistry. I bring together the three universities in Berlin, TU, FU, HU, all of them having faculties of chemistry and two industry players in order to achieve one thing, innovations that disrupt the way we do chemistry from teaching, from researching and most importantly of bringing innovation to market because in chemistry we need products that are sustainable, that are not harming our lives, um, that are recyclable, that are based on renewables rather than fossils and so on. And this is basically the goal. Um, around us we have set up a so-called ecosystem, so partners that are relevant for innovation in chemistry, like yeah, um, small medium-sized enterprises, big uh, enterprises, facilitators, um, also uh, Umweltbundesamt, so federal agencies of environmental protection because in chemistry it's an industry that is highly regulated and with regulation you can either hinder new uh, innovations or facilitate new innovations and they, and they want to understand and support to understand how, how can they do the trick and obviously also VC, so the capital scene is also engaged. So what is the mission of, of Green Chem, right? The Green Chem, oh, very importantly, I have to say thank you, first of all, uh, to you guys and all, to all German taxpayers because we received 10 million euros over the next 10, year, day, uh, 10 years from uh, the Federal Ministry of Research and Education in order to set this ecosystem running. Um, we had the kickoff almost four weeks ago, uh, officially started in March this year. So thanks to all taxpayers. Uh, to, to give me that money uh, as the coordinator, I promise you I will spend it very wisely uh, for, for the right things. Um, that's at least how I take it. Um, so wh what, is the, what is the mission? Yeah, uh, picture can say more than a thousand words. So the, the, the metaphor yeah, of the mission is we are building a bridge, a bridge between the chemical research and the market, right? In order to facilitate findings in uh, green chemistry research, making it towards the market because, as I said, we need products that we can buy, that we can use, that are better than the current ones. Yeah? So that's basically the idea uh, and obviously such a bridge is not no one way, it is also a way towards research, so we want to engage with corporations, with startups that are already implemented in the market and want to understand where are your sustainability issues. Where is your current product not yet sustainable? It is maybe environmentally seen better, but it's not yet there. It's not yet fully recyclable. It's not, not yet where we're supposed to be. And that's exactly, I think, where research can also contribute in order to enhance um, sustainability of a product. Um, well, and then now comes the question, maybe uh, some of you, okay, chemistry in Berlin, that doesn't sound, that doesn't feel right. Berlin is not supposed to be like the chemical hotspot, right? If you look, where is the chemical hotspot? It's somewhere in Leverkusen, right? Uh, Wuppertal and uh, like where the Rhine is, right? There are many, many chemical sites. That's where the chemistry in Germany um, is happening, not though in Berlin. But I say, actually, that's our advantage. We have several advantages here in Berlin. First of all, um, basically, we have the mindset. We have lots of young people who are arguing the way how we are currently consuming and, and having products is not how we're supposed to have it in 10 or 20 years from now. We have to change. Sustainability is, you know, like with uh, Fridays for Future, the, uh, 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 the climate activists and so on, we are really in the capital of Germany. We are arguing and we have to keep <laughs> doing that, right? So we're not yet there. So uh, I think the mindset is one thing. Um, Second of all, the research. Uh, we have lots and lots of research institutions, but most of all, I would say, we don't have the historic baggage. We, we don't see the chemical sites. We don't have the arguments of saying, well, this is not working because then I have to you know, deconstruct everything. And so we have no such thing. We, we are basically, we can go from scratch. And this is one of the big advantage, but nevertheless, and this is also one of the advantages I'm working on, in chemistry, it's about, you know, it's a very practical science. You do need laboratory, you do need scale-up facilities, you do need to do the products. 
And this is something where we also at Berlin, what we compose and we set up um, under the umbrella of Green Camp is unique. No one has that in all over Germany. And this is with regard to the infrastructure. Um, and there I want to introduce you, this is the last concept, and then we are finished for like lecture part. This is the last uh, uh, concept I want to introduce, which is like the technology readiness level, the TRL. Basically uh, invented by the NASA when they were flying to the moon. Yeah, it was a big project, so they chunked the project into nine steps of technology development. Yeah, so let me explain. So when you do research, yeah, you're going to laboratory with your professor, you do research, crazy things and all of a sudden you discover something. You're still TRL zero. It's not even TRL one. It's just a scientific finding. But if you take that scientific finding, write down on a piece of paper the idea of how that scientific finding can make a contribution to the market, to our daily lives, how you can create a business around that, then you have an idea, then you have TRL one, right? And if you climb up the ladder of technology development, you, at the ultimate, you produce with that the product that you sell to the market, that is really implemented in the market. That is the last step. And if you look, and I said we have an advantage in terms of infrastructure, if you look at, um, at, yeah, at, at the infrastructure um, 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 anforderung, uh, dependencies, uh, criteria, sorry? Requirements, thank you, that's you know, very, very, very good. Um, uh, then you can um, uh, separate in between four different steps regarding like how, like reaction volume, whatever, but how much mass of product you're producing. Like in the first four TRLs, it's about, okay, taking that idea and finding out the borders, like how far can I go, what are key ap ap um, applications, what are the requirements for those uh, um, um, applications and then you want to wiggle your idea, your scientific finding into the room of free, uh, free, um, uh, operating windows, so to speak. And basically you do that in very small amounts. Yeah? You do not want to burn lots of product or lots of material. You do that in laboratory scale, grams, a few grams. Then at the end you come up, okay, you find your first customer and they say, well, that's interesting. And at a certain point the customer says to you, okay, I want a kilogram. I want to test your material. I want to see whether this is really working in my application. And then you're talking about the kilogram. Once the, let's assume the, the customer, the potential is happy and says, okay, we want to order 10 tons of you per year. You're not going to full production. You prepare production uh, into like this 100 kg area. And then once that is, that is fixed, you then execute production depending on your product and the size. And what we have here in Berlin, this is unique. We basically have every step, every infrastructure requirement you can imagine. First of all, we have what I'm leading, the John Warner Center for Startups in Green Chemistry, the Chemical Invention Factory, as well as the Inculab. We have infrastructure laboratory um, that is at the TU Berlin offering space for pre-seed, early stage spin-up projects. Yeah, also in at the HU Iris Alashof, it's a research facility, opens up the doors for startups that, that have the necessity for their infrastructure. Then for the next range, we can go up to 150 liters in the scale-up lab of Professor Rainer Haag at the FU Berlin. Then one of our partners opens up their so-called Technikum, like up to a, a, a thousand liter. And then we have all um, the areas where you can really locate um, your production in the area of Berlin. So basically, when you're a researcher, when you have something, when you have a patent <laughs> and, and you want to bring it to market, we have not only the ecosystem and you know the feel-good factor, but we have also the very highly costly infrastructure built in order to support you. And last but not least, we are not talking about just an idea. Uh, we have built it about the last, I'm into the startup scene since 2011 with my own two spin outs. I'm now at university, as I'm always saying, I'm an entrepreneur who went back to university in order to help the next generation do an easier and a better job than I did. Um, and this is the result of uh, basically 12 years of, of work um, to really put up uh, a community of startups from different, uh, not only fields, but only also different stages of their lifetime. From being very, very early, just having an idea, 
we want to do something up until once, which I will welcome like wild uh, on a stage for really further, right? Up until people that are really already selling big, big volumes. And this is what happens, right? If you have those exchange between I have an idea and someone who knows how to execute, then I, I think it can flourish. And this, um, yeah, this is what our vision is, what uh, John said. He thinks that Berlin can become the Silicon Valley in green chemistry startups and really that innovations in the field of green chemistry to all of our benefits for us as society, for our planet, hopefully uh, can will come from Berlin. That's at least what we are working for. So far uh, from me, well, yeah, that's basically the bracket, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so again, I love what I do. I do what I love, not only privately, but also I have a very big privilege of receiving that amount of money in order to set this up, to combine the universities, to combine 38 startups uh, and growing numbers and to invite people. And my narrative is very easy. The older generation, and I consider myself, you know, in that range, I'm getting older and older. Um, so we kind of fucked up with the planet, right? We messed it up. Um, and disruptive innovation theory tells us you better do not bet on us, right? You better do not bet on the old pals. We need the young generation. And Green Chem and all the partners are willing to give all the support free of charge, no equity taken, no, no shares taken, in order to bring your ideas or the ideas of your friends towards market in order to increase our all lives and, and the planet's life so this is uh, this is i think what what we what we are striving for to make like this picture count and give the mother earth a little rest so far from my side i'm now open for any questions first of all to the talk if there are none is, are, are there any questions first of all yeah there's one question do we have a mic so that, that people in the ah that's me <laughs> yeah it's on <laughs> thank you <coughs> okay, thank you for your talk. Just a brief question. When you talk about chemistry, does this include life sciences like drug development, pharmaceutics and, and stuff like this, mm -hmm. which are very different things like, like you need clinical studies and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Is this included in chemistry? Um, so, yes it is, kind of. Um, so I always saying like, I have, we have only two requirements. Very good that you told me that word. I needed it. So we have only two requirements that you um, that you are welcome in Green Chem. First of all, your innovation must have a positive impact on planet. Yeah? So if your pharmaceutical says, okay, the ones currently in market are accumulating in nature and are causing like thinning of of the shell of birds, for instance, my innovation isn't. Uh, there's a clear benefit for the planet, first check. And second check is, can we really contribute with our infrastructure, so the laboratory, the scale-up and so on, as well as the ecosystem around it, can we really contribute to your success? And this is the second check. And if both are there, if both are green lights, you're happily welcome. So that's, that's the first part. So I'm, I, love, I do love chemistry, but for me that's... There is, for me, there is no fight between chemistry and biotechnology approaches, right? I think we need both. And only relying on one is stupid. So we need to rely on both. But if we have some biotechnology approaches, our uh, uh, laboratory infrastructure is not made for this, unfortunately. We're really focusing on chemistry um, innovations, which is why the requirements like certain types of fume hoods we do not have, so we cannot contribute. But if you're, uh, if you're talking about Lyme sciences, having a small molecule, a chemical synthesized molecule, I would argue, yes, it is. Um, but also saying uh, Charité uh, with their incubation program also do have a very valid um, ecosystem around. So yeah, that's like maybe a little vague, but let's talk about it. If you have an innovation, let's talk about it. Um, and if we are not the ones, um, well, we are really well connected, we can open doors and, and, and guide it to the right persons. That's at least, uh, it's not about us, it's about making the planet better and then pinpointing you to the right persons. Other questions? There, I see one. Hey, 
Um, has there been an innovation lately that you yourself found like especially exciting? <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, everyone. Uh, really, uh, there are so, so many things. It would be very, very um, unfair to pinpoint one. But I give you one. Um, I give you one, one thing I'm really curious about because the, the thing is not on the slide yet, but I'm working on it. Um, it comes from, from Israel, our friends in Israel, uh, making a hard, tough time at the moment. Um, so they have discovered uh, a, um, a technology where they can basically capture CO2 that is bound in, in, the, in water and bind it with the ions um, in the water towards a solid phase. So, and basically that solid phase that uh, uh, calcium carbonate it is, you can then sell as a product. And, uh, and so it's really, it's doing two things. It's uh, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere via the water, right? So the water gets the uh, CO2 back from the atmosphere by itself. You don't have to do a, a thing. Um, and then you bound it towards a product and bound it there forever. And the order of magnitude they're, they're envisioning and they're like uh, the, the results from the really like highest science are super promising. So I'm, you know, the, the carbon dioxide threat, it is there, but I think we have solutions. Uh, so we, we do have solutions there that are not yet marketable, but I'd say like in 10, 15 years from, from now or even beforehand, um, we will see dramatic decline in CO2 uh, concentration in the atmosphere due to those technologies. And that makes me really, really promising and really excited about it to help. Yeah. Cool. So then we have a light uh, Q&A session. Um, now you had a lot of talk about myself. I didn't talk about my startups because that's not about me. Let's hear it from some of our startups, which is wild. I don't want to make the pitch for you, Stefanie. I welcome you on stage. Uh, you get the second mic and please introduce your startup. Yes, hi. Thank you for having me. My name is Stephanie. Uh, I work with Wild. Uh, we are a company from Berlin, based in Berlin, founded in Berlin in 2021 as a profit for purpose company, um, which means that we do not only think our products as a circular thing, but also our economy as a circular thing, and uh, that we see a lot of benefit from keeping everything in the circle, in the loop, and uh, thinking of everything as a connected thing. So what do we do? Uh, we produce um, products made from seaweed that are mainly absorbent products or in the overall universe, in the algaeverse, we see the absorbent products based on seaweed fibers or non-fiber applications. And um, our first product is the Calpon. I have it here. So it's a seaweed-based tampon that is um, meant to also break the stigma around uh, tampons to um, create a product that leads to a more sustainable way of producing tampons, period products, also other absorbent products like um, diapers, baby diapers, um, also incontinence material in the long run, um, but also that empowers people to, um, yeah, talk openly about issues, to also see um, what they can do to their health by just using more health-friendly products than the conventional products. And um, yeah, we have a bunch of things to do. Um, I think we will go further into this uh, in the Q&A session later. Yeah. So this is just a brief presentation of WILD. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So now, now it's like we thought about giving it some credibility of having a f what I was told is a format of discussion or exchange, which is a fireside chat. And we will get two chairs <laughs> <In> <laughs> on <fire>. stage <laughs> and a fire. Hopefully not. And then, yeah, just have a short discussion about. Um, your experiences as joining, the, you, you joined, you told me, in February this year, right? Yes. Um, so you're not there from the very first beginning. Nevertheless, I, I suppose it was a really steep learning curve for you. It was, yes. Yeah. So um, what you have figured out, what is, um, what is your motivation? Why did you join? 
what did you learn from the from the founders what is their motivation of doing it and where do you see the alignment with the 12 principles of chemistry um, well first of all I think I already joined because I found the idea of producing really innovative products menstrual products um, I found that idea like overwhelming because I feel like the menstrual market is one that has not been touched since it had been created. So, I mean, yeah, there have been some, some developments, but um, what I think is that it's super important to have non-reusable products that are still healthy and um, good for nature because um, in the end, if you don't tackle that problem, if half of the population menstruates, then it's a big problem if you only produce waste, but you can't um, rely on everybody being able to, for example, use reusable products. So, um, yeah, this was one, one thing that led me to uh, yeah, write my application for WILD, actually. And um, what I also find very interesting is that um, both Ines and Melly, um, the founders of WILD, um, are able to really rethink things. So, as you mentioned earlier, it's like you want to learn from the young people and I think they have the ideas, they have the drive, they have also like the ability to see what's possible in what kind of environment and how can we change the environment in order to reach our goal, so to go further. Mm. And I think um, that, yeah, this is also what combines us that like taking together all of our energy, all, all our levels uh, that can bring us forward. Cool, so it's, it's really purpose and I, I know the two founders obviously, <laughs> uh, I think they are as you described and it's really good to see also an, another powerful woman yeah, and putting the finger into the wound where, where we you know not supposed to talk about and really I think that's where Uh, you know where innovation take place so whenever you guys see a field of in, in your life you think okay actually no one talks about that this might be very very interesting <laughs> uh, so uh, cool so uh, with regard to the 12 principles what, what would you say what is your what uh, what is your take or wild's take on on it um we have different takes i think because um one thing that we see that is also leading to a health problem um, in the chemistry of conventional period products is that um, it's not regenerative. So it's not biodegradable or not degradable mm. without the bio even. It's not degradable. So it piles up and um, yeah, gets out in the world and just piles up. Um, and the other take is that um, we want to reduce, significantly reduce uh, the use of pollutants throughout the process because we are still creating a man-made fiber for example by using chemistry but actually by using greener chemistry so it's a water-based process that um, also the extraction of the raw material is much less harmful in the whole life cycle of the raw material but also in the end of the whole product so these are like the main points that I want to point out now. So circula circularity, circularity, like yes. the renewable feedstock and also the, the synthesis or the treat, no it's not the synthesis, but the treatment of the raw materials in water-based process, that's yes. uh, cool. That's, uh, so that's, I think it's very important to understand no innovation touches all 12 principles, right? I see here three principles touched mm -hmm. and if you, would, uh, if you would discuss with John with his 350 uh, uh, patents, He would always say, like, those patents, none of them have has touched more than three principles. Uh, it's not about touching all of them, but taking them as a guidance. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, sustainability benefits, I think we talked about. Or would you add something towards it? Of your product, of your... Of your well, I can talk a lot about <laughs> <laughs> sustainability benefits of our product. Yeah, do that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, Well, we have different aspects of sustainability. So, for example, if you take the raw material when you com uh, compare it to the conventional material that is being used. So, um, if we use seaweed, we have a material that is naturally grown in the ocean, so it doesn't need fresh water. 
it doesn't need fertilizers, it doesn't need uh, any pesticides, whatever. Um, it's rather on the opposite that it is able to um, counteract the acidific acidification of the oceans and while growing it also um, it 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 um, liefert. Delivers. It, uh, thank you. <laughs> it it delivers an ecosystem where um, fish can grow, where other species can grow. So the whole thing is, um, while we grow our raw material, we can also grow the environment, mm -hmm. and this is like really circular thinking. And I mean, of course, this is always a question of scale, of course, because if I outscale it and I overrun the whole ecosystem and the algae is not able to regrow in a, in a sufficient manner, then I will have the 3.5 mm -hmm. again. Sure. But if I can um, like restore a certain part of the algae forest and I can um, take out some of the raw material, then I can get to the 0 0.9. Mm -hmm. So um, this is one part that is really important to me and I know also to Enos and Melly. So, um, yeah. But current, uh, do I, uh, I, I? I'm not sure. But do you uh, do you plan on, on on cultivating your own seaweed for your own production, or is it currently buying from producers, which I suppose is at the moment like kind of a bottleneck, or isn't it a bottleneck? It is kind of a bottleneck. Actually, it wouldn't have to be, but the industry is like really slow, and um, there are big players that really dominate the market and it's kind of hard to uh, get to other sources. But um, we are currently focusing on um, sourcing local seaweed or raw material made from seaweed. And um, our idea is that's why we also um, keep in touch with science people, um, with universities, with you guys, um, that we are also looking into how can we make the sourcing so efficient that, for example, we are not bound to one species of algae, mm -hmm. so that we can source whatever comes, for example, to the beach. There's a lot of seaweed being uh, brought to the beach just naturally. So is there a possibility of sourcing that kind of raw material, which is right now not the case, because we're still in the hygiene sector and we have to comply with certain requirements and stuff like that, of course. It's very important because it's contributing directly to our health, the menstruator's health. Um, but we think, we're convinced that there are other, other possibilities that still have not been thought and that we have to put a lot of like science stuff I'm not going to say the <laughs> S S H word. Um, no, that we have to look, uh, to put a lot of brain work into developing mm -hmm. this whole chain in a more greener way. And uh, yeah, cool. Um, so I touched it a little bit uh, about you know being uh, in in our markets. Your uh, startups are usually touched by regulations heavily. So what, uh, what can you tell us about the challenges, you know, coming from seaweed is more in the food market, I, I suppose, or some of us might know it, um, but coming into a non-food market, into the market you're in. What are the challenges, so to speak? Um, well, one of the main challenges is um, the existing market, so the dominant uh, parties in the menstrual care product market. Um, because, of course, this is a price-driven sector. And if you come um, into the market with a new raw material that is, of course, not being sourced in such a oversourcing way, so the price is higher, of course, because the price gets lower the more you source. I don't know how that makes sense, but it's, it's the market. And um, so you come in with something that is being sourced in a sustainable way and everybody is like, well, but you're never going to hit the price. And then we have to convince others that it's still possible to hit the price or to hit a reasonable price because maybe the price is, should be different mm -hmm. because the price we pay is 
in money is low, but for health, for example, it's not low. So, so there are a lot of residuals in the in um, products. I don't want to scare you, please. They're still being tested. They're still cool to use, but um, we think there is a lot of um, space to Luft nach oben. Improvement, yeah. Yeah, yeah space cool. to improvement. Okay, so <clears throat> I talked a little bit about the startups and uh, the startup environment. Um, so looking at maybe the audience and also the people watching us, what kind of advice would you give when people think about doing something on their own, starting up something? What, what are your learnings? What, what, what can you advise from your learnings? personal ones? Um, well, the learnings I saw since working at Wild, which is not such a long time, but still I had like really a lot of learnings. And one main thing is that it is so, so important to believe in your own ideas and to find out why you think that those ideas can work and then find partners that maybe think alike and those partners, you can find them anywhere. So you can find them in other, for example, small companies and other startups, but you can also find them in big players that are just not in the spot to do the invention themselves. So you find people who you can talk to and it's always crucial to always um, not lose the focus because we are still part of the whole industry, of course. We're still trying to disrupt the industry by bringing in a new raw material, so we still have to work um, within the boundaries that are given by the industry. And yeah, for example, what you do uh, is, we benefit a lot from that, that you offer this kind of guidance to bring in global players, to bring in big factories, big companies, I mean, and um, bring them together with the smaller uh, entrepreneurs who are having the ideas in order to, um, how do you say, um, to, to um, the hurdles, yeah, to, yeah. to the decrease barriers. their hurdles, mm -hmm. to, to lower the barriers, yes. Mm -hmm. Cool, I mean, we, we touched about it a little bit earlier in a private session, yes. uh, but uh, I think it's very important that, you know, the, the, the importance of eye level you know, talking mm -hmm. on eye level. Can you can you explain a little what I mean or what we mean by that? What, why is this so important and what, what do you take on it? Yes, um, this is super important because also like if we as Wild, as a quite small company, talk to big players, um, we always see it as um, we're not collaborating project-wise, but we're trying to find partners that we can rely on and that they also are interested in what we have to say. So that we always look for people, be it the big companies, be it the small companies, or just friends, advisors, whoever, um, that will also have a positive impact from working with us. So it's not we, of course we have questions, and of course we wanna ask questions and have an open discussion, but this is the point. We wanna have an open discussion and not be the ones that are just like, okay, we have a cool idea. Ah, uh, you say it doesn't work. Okay, well, let's just skip it because that's not how you disrupt something. Yeah, it's so open. it's kind of finding the leverage between um, we wanna put our ideas up front but at the same time, we see that it's really important to also listen to the others. Like, why are they doing this mm -hmm. in a certain way? And why hasn't it been changed? So maybe we can, like, skip this. Yeah, yeah cool. So it's, you know, it's about skepticism. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in startups, you also have skepticism. You don't know whether it's working or not. But you work very constructively with it. So... Eye level means, I think, is expressing the skepticism between each other, but then approaching not on the negative down, this is not working, why? But, ah, mm -hmm. this might be interesting, let's, let's try it out. Yeah? And, and not, you know, tear each other down, but let's, you know, like, okay, this sounds interesting, why not? And I think also to find out where the skepticism comes from. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, as you said before, there are many people who say, oh, chemistry is bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you don't tell me why you think that chemistry is bad, then we can tackle that problem. Yeah, but if you 
op and openly discuss why you have those those thoughts, those um, 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 Vorteile. <laughs> Advantages. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, We're talking fun here. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Um, then we can work with that and then we can find workarounds or improvements or yep, create something new together. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So last two questions and I would open up to the, to the crowd. Um, so I talked a lot about you know, disruptive innovations and why do we need startups. Uh, I hopefully explained it quite well, I don't know, but um, <laughs> you being and a startup, an entrepreneur, you know, being one of uh, those entities that says, okay, we don't accept it, we want to change. What is your take on, on, on disruptive change, on bringing products to market? Like, what, how do you see your own role uh, uh, as a startup entrepreneur in, in disruptive change? Um, that is a very wide question. Wild how question. <laughs> a wild <laughs> question. Um, how do we see our own role? I think um, what we do is that we are still small enough to innovate things that have always been done like that. So we still have the creativity and the, um, like we're looking for something new and we want to develop forward. Mm -hmm. And um, and you told me beforehand, like kind of, you're aware of that disruptive step you have to take, but that might be a little bit too big to take at once. Yes. And you have to, being aware means also, okay, looking where is the point of making one step towards it, of achieving it. So it's finding a balance. That is also what I uh, tried to say before, that you always have to look at the existing processes, like um, what are the key mm -hmm. points that need to be changed like immediately and what are the points that are not easily going to be changed so how can I find my way into the process with my new idea mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. don't change everything all at once because of course that won't work mm -hmm. then you have to build your own industry and easy be creative, be smart, yes. right? Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, then uh, only uh, like the last question. You know, you're working on on a on a product that one could potentially buy, or can we already buy that product? Where can we buy it, and what's next? What are your future plans? Um, actually, this Calpon is still the beta version that had been uh, used also in our consumer trials. So. Um, we have gotten the feedback from menstruators um, towards this product that we kind of invented and then we kind of created how we want to do it. And now we've gotten the feedback from the consumer trial and this feedback is currently being processed into our next product, the Gen 1 um, Kelpon, that is ready to market uh, by beginning of next year. Cool. Yes, so we're currently in the production cycle and we're working strongly in the back uh, to make everything work and to get in all the improvements that we see from the feedback we gotten from the consumer trial um, that we see are still necessary and what we also think for ourselves we find necessary. And um, yep, what you can do is uh, you can subscribe uh, to the waiting list. So as soon as the Kelpon is ready, um, you will have it flying to your doorstep. And um, also, if you are interested in our mission and you want to get involved, you can also head to our uh, webpage, uh, which is wildness.de. It's not the easiest, but I Figure think you'll out. make it. <laughs> you Google it. <laughs> yes, you Google it. And um, yeah, we have, uh, we're looking for uh, new talents. So maybe you're interested or maybe you want to support us in a different way, then always head to the webpage and find out also more about profit, profit for purpose companies and steward ownership, which is the other circular part of our company where we try to interpret uh, economic models in a new, modern, more sustainable, in a circular way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. It's really it's a pleasure to have you here. You're a great team, great product. I'm really looking forward to see that coming to the market. Uh, also, you know, team is growing. Success brings more work. 
brings more products, brings new employees. So good luck with that. Um, I'm I'm, glad, I'm really honored. And now I would uh, yeah ask the crowd: Do you have any questions to Stephanie? What yeah? What are your questions? Yeah, there's one. The mic is coming too. Hey, uh, I, I'm not sure if I catch that right in the beginning that you also are about to do like diapers and other materials. Um, and is it also beta version right now or is that something for the future when, when you're cool with the tampon at the market? Um, we had one small diaper project where, um, but that was a collaboration with another company, a German company called Goldeimer. Um, and we co-developed a diaper inlay that is fully bio, uh, compostable, not biodegradable, but compostable. And um, there we tested the first type of algae-based inlay for the absorbent core in order to overcome the super absorbers that are currently in the diapers. And um, for now, we have to concentrate on the Calpon. We would like to develop everything all at once because it's super exciting. But um, obviously you can't do that because then everything will just be halfway. And uh, as far as I can say, the diaper is probably going to be the next great big project. There was another question just beside. Hey, um, I got two questions. The first one is if do you think this kind of raw material can be used in other applications like packaging or construction materials in your experience working with this raw material. And the other one, it's about the regulations because this is a type of product that is used on the body. So how can you uh, make sure that uh, in the long term it has no consequences or have a side effect and how do you manage to uh, work with the people that makes the regulation for this kind of products? Mm -hmm. Thank you for both questions. Um, the regulation thing first, um, there are lots of regulations um, that are quite strict for uh, the health benefits and um, the seaweed-based fibers have been used before in medical applications as well. So there is a long history of safe use, it just has not been used in um, consumer products because uh, regulations are so high and um, yeah, people want to use cheaper, cheaper raw materials. That's kind of the sad end of the story. Um, but this is how, of course, we're going to have more consumer trials because this is also something that we are looking into. We're also working together with other universities in order to um, do the proper biocompatibility tests and in order to uh, really show that this is not a harmful product. And now I forgot the first question, I'm so Other sorry. applications of your material. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there are other applications. There's also uh, one CIF family member, <laughs> the Mujo Lab. Um, for example, they're working on um, algae-based um, 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 packaging. Huh? packaging. Foils. So mm -hmm. foils and everything like the real plastic. And um, yeah, so there are a lot of different use cases for the raw material. And also, um, like for example, when you do the extraction of the, of the algae, you have different stages of um, extracts. So it's not only one extract that comes out because of course the algae is made of more than just one component. And so you can use a lot of different components for different areas of application. And also, um, for example, they're in the personal care space, there being uh, a lot of products made with parts of seaweed and, yeah. Cool, maybe. Th there are two questions, yeah. Okay, so you've mentioned several times that the product wouldn't be cheap. And how do you plan to convince people to really use the product? Because I see the pro problem that of course, it's sustainable, but a lot of people say, okay, well, it's, it is sustainable, but I don't, like, I don't have the money to buy the expensive one, and for me, it's better to use the cheaper one, so yeah. 
Um, we see two different things here. One is that right now the scale for production of the raw material from um, seaweed that is going to be used in a non-food sector that is not a medical application is like really low. So by creating products and we don't want to be the only ones creating those products, but we want to like also have other companies creating non-food applications of the seaweed raw material. Um, we create the certain kind of leverage. So we have to stay on the edge of over um, oversourcing the raw material, but at the same time we can increase the um, Nachfrage, demand. The, the demand in a way that also prices will drop because um, there will be more efficient processes, for example, for extracting the raw material. Because right now this is also like, depending on where you go, but this is also like quite ancient and the efficiency of the plants is quite low and stuff like that. And this also um, raises the price, of course, of the raw material. And the other part is that um, we think that not only menstruators should be paying for menstrual products, but this should be a low for everyone. So we have not figured out uh, the, fully co the full concept. I think uh, there are many people thinking about a concept that could be usable, but um, this is also a way of, of lowering the price in the end and making it affordable for everyone because we don't believe that the healthy product should only be available for the rich people, but should be available for everyone in best case for free, but we still have a long way to go. <coughs> okay, so I have a second question. Um, and if the demand of that product, if that is a sustainable idea and the demand will rise, um, don't you think that it is something like a seaweed is growing in the ocean or in the sea? And uh, don't you think by using a large amount of that, we are like, um, I don't know, uh, going into an ecosystem and disturbing something there? Yeah. Yeah, that is a very good question and that is what I mean by uh, over extracting because um, you don't have to extract the whole plant in order to uh, gain the raw material. So there are different ways of harvesting. Um, also the harvesting of the seaweed is already highly regulated so that this over harvesting doesn't take place. But um, what we're also working on with another university <laughs> is um, that we're trying to find out how we could um, restore kelp forests. So how can we grow the kelp forest on one side and on the other side, like take something out, but in a way that it's always still an environment for the animals to live in. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and I hope it's going, it will be going well. Thank you. There was also one question in the back, and like one, two, and then let's, but it's fine. I, it, those two questions doesn't really matter about them. Yeah, you, you, you will post your question, but two more questions, and then I think we hit the time limit because I have also two questions. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very interesting. I, I'm a little bit curious, what, what are your plans with your with your startup company, do you want, um, if it turns out to be a good idea, do you want to sell it by yourself, which means setting up a marketing, sales and everything, or are your plans um, to, to sell the whole stuff? I mean, you, you probably have patents to sell your intellectual property, to sell the company to a bigger company that they may produce it with certain risk that they, don't do it. What? I don't know whether you want to answer this question. What? What? What are your plans or your kind of business? I would model? love to answer this, but this is currently like in the developmental phase. So we're still not bound to one way, and I think we will never be bound to one way because we're wild. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> this is. Uh, it's also very personal, right? It's, it's, it's a very it's, personal yes. decision of each and every founder which path to pursue. Yes. But I always say it's like, you know, like doing what you love to do for the end of your life, it's nice, but if, if plans change, you can sell something that's of value. But, uh, 
But yeah. I think one one thing that I can say towards this is that, as I said before, we don't care if we're the only one producing this or if there are a lot of small companies producing these kind of products because what we see is the benefit for us, for the environment, for menstruators, for like us as in the society. So if more people want to join, why not? This is something very... Okay. Like, let's put it at the last question and then it turns out to be me. Can you, can you tell us a little bit, you mentioned that Wild, Wild is one of the companies that are part of this sort of incubation cycle that you helped. Can you tell us a little bit about what your interaction was with them and how you helped them and, and how you were helped? I mean, I'm sure there's two stories <laughs> on, on both sides. Like, what, what Shall was I answer that maybe? Yeah. Yes, because, yeah. This because you're, you're yes. pretty new to the team. Uh, I think Wild, uh, Wild is kind of an exception because the idea was born outside of the three universities that, that, that are partnering, uh, which I find very, I see that now more often coming. It's more from the uh, uh, product design type of, you know, like experimenting with materials and then going into like the business model and the material side rather than coming from chemistry, from the material science and then thinking about the business, right? So uh, what we did, we helped like in the very early phases about characterization of the material, of what you said, like having different feedstocks, where, where are the boundaries, and there we, uh, we did like a thesis work, scientific thesis work together with professors uh, and students who accompanied the early phase developments. And now it's more like on those events like this, and exchanging with more grown-up uh, teams and now like Wild is switching more into a role as being an advisor to early phase teams rather than receiving early phase advice uh, because they are more, I wouldn't say grown-up, but they are very experienced in the, in the, like in the middle phase. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Cool, so I would like cut the questions from your end. Uh, now I got two more questions to you. Uh, when we please pull out your, uh, your mobile phones because I want to pose that question with a Slido. You've heard about one innovation, and so please name any particular sustainable innovation or innovations or initiatives you're excited about or, wish you or which you wish to see developed in the near future. Yeah, so you all, c what I want, the background is, you all come from an own background. I love fly fishing, for instance. Each and every one has its own background. So go into your own background and think about where do you need an innovation, where do you want to see an innovation occurring in order to change the current status quo, in order to be more sustainable. Yeah, so think about it, pose it. This is kind of a citizen science approach. We will take that and think about with the chemistry community of what is there, what can we do, and so on. Yeah, so what are the innovations from your particular point of view you wish to see in the near future? So I don't see any scanning. So I would love to ask the regie to show the results. And I learned there is also the QR code, cool. Clothing, ah, nice. Hygiene products, yeah, yeah. <laughs> diapers, <laughs> bio-based chemicals, yeah, that's cool, become a fabric, yeah, coffee capsules, yeah, cool, substitution of plastic, yeah, airplane fuel, yeah, the so-called SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, flying, home biogas plant, oh yeah, that's cool, plant growing in cities, Uh -huh. Yeah, reusable paper options. Three more people typing. Okay. Carbon binding, yeah, that's cool. I'm working on it. Thank you. I see like the two more people's typing. So we take that so to, to get a, uh, a cloud of words and, and think about it, digest it. Um, and now I would love to like, go back to the presentation mode. And that's the last thing of today, your last duty, so to speak. Uh, good, yep. <coughs> like the last thing is another scan, because this was our first time here. We, we never did that at Berlin Science Week. 
and we want to learn from you whether you liked it, where do you see improvements and so on. So please scan this QR code and give us your feedback on today's sessions. There are several questions uh, so that we can improve and that, can, then that we can get better and better and better. So for this, um, we give you like a few minutes. Nevertheless, I would love I see one more guy scanning it. That's good. Um, I would love to say thank you. Please fill in the questionnaire. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. It was great to talk to you. Thank you for yeah. having me. Thanks Please. the audience for attending. Uh, and yeah, talk about chemistry. Raise your your questions, as you said so. Yeah, your concerns. It's very important. Uh, that's we have to unfold chemistry. It has to come out of the dark zone into the green zone. Uh, and I think we have more more innovations to come. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>